money management. And uh, uh, I rarely talk about money. I, I, I don't know why. It's just not my favorite subject. I mean, I like money. That is my favorite subject. I just don't like talking to you about it. Uh, so I don't do that a lot. Uh, but I just felt in my heart that we needed to recircle around and do a mini-series on finances, and, and I'll show you why. We're going to lay some groundwork today, uh, just some fundamentals. I'm going to take you through uh, some instances with Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through an instant with John the Baptist, and then on to the early church, and we're going to look at how they looked at finances. Uh, but let me read to you something that A.W. Tozer wrote. And this is what A.W. Tozer wrote some years back. He said, the man of pseudo-faith will fight for his verbal creed, but refuse flatly to allow himself to get in a predicament where his future will depend upon that creed being true. Basically, what he's saying is that man will fight for what he believes, but he really will not allow himself to be put in a situation where he has to stand on what he believes. He goes on, and he says, he always provides himself with a secondary ways of escape, so he will have a way out if the roof caves in. What we need very badly these days is a company of Christians who are prepared to trust God as completely now as they know they must do at the last day. That's what we need today. People that, that will believe and trust God today as they live just to the same level as they will when they stand before God and he is allowing them into the kingdom of heaven. So where do we go with money? And I'm going to give you just a couple of principles. I'm going to lay, like I said, some groundwork. But basically, when it comes to finances, when it comes to finances, your eternal placement value, your faith is predicated on how you handle finances. And I'm going to show you how that works. Finances tells your story and tells what's going to happen when you go to heaven. It is based on how you and I deal with finances and how you and I deal with possessions. Jesus said it this way when being confronted. Jesus said that you cannot serve mammon and the kingdom of God. You, you cannot serve both. There is a God of mammon. There is a God of this world. There are, 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 and he lays principles and dictates how things are to run according to his rules. There is that God. And Jesus said that you cannot serve the God of mammon. You cannot serve mammon and God. You cannot do that. There can only be one ruler in your life. There's not two, there's not three. God does not play second seat to any other God. God is primary. He is number one in your life, or he is nothing in your life. You, you cannot have God and have other gods. Jesus just, he just flat out said that. There can be no other gods before me. He said that all the way back at the beginning of the law. There can be no other gods before me. I will not stand over the nation of Israel, and then in the New Testament, in your life, where there are other gods. I am God. God alone, or I am not God. It's that simple. So Jesus said that you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't do it. It cannot be done. Now, it's interesting because as I thought about this and as I began to look at Scripture, it dawned on me that if the Bible were written today, I mean, it's a historical book. We've had it for years now. But if the Bible was written today, somebody wrote the Bible today, I don't believe it would be a bestseller. In fact, I don't believe it would make it to the shelves of Barnes and Noble. I don't, because the critics, when they realize what the Bible has to say about money and possessions, the critics would criticize it so deeply that it would never make the bestsellers list. It would never go to print. It would never go to Barnes and Noble. 
And today, when people read the Bible, they tend to read the Bible only to find out what is going to happen in eternity. How do I get there? What is God going to do for me today? How is God going to bless me? Am I really forgiven? What makes me feel good? Am I going to be blessed? That is the mindset that people read the Bible today. To extract what is going to happen in the future but to ignore the principles that the Bible lays for how you live your life today. In fact, most churches will preach about the future. Most churches will preach about what is going to make you feel good, but, but very few churches will preach and teach about how you live today. And why would the why people say, well, why do I need the Bible to do that when I can go to Barnes and Noble and, and Barnes and Noble, I can go to the shelf and I can I can pick a book that says Think and Grow Rich, How to Make It, Living the Good Life. There's a book called Rich Dad. I've got all of these books to tell me how to prosper and how to be something and to be a somebody. And why would I need to go to the Bible when I have all of that good information right on the shelf at Barnes and Noble? I can look at the Wall Street Journal. I can look at Fortune Magazine. I can look at all these magazines that tell me how to do it. So why would I look at the Bible? Why is it important what the Bible says about that? I mean, isn't there enough out there to tell me what to do with my money? But here's the interesting fact when you look at Scripture. The Bible devotes twice as many verses to the subject of money and possessions than the faith and prayer combined. In fact, I'll tell you exactly how many verses there are. 2,350 verses. 2,350 verses deal with money and possessions, and that is twice the amount of scriptures dealing with money and possessions than deal with your faith and prayer. So if we were to discuss today, as far as subject matter, which is more important, money and possessions or prayer and faith? I, I would have to bet on money and possessions because that's where the bulk of Scripture is. The Bible has more to say over your money and possessions than it does your faith and prayer. In fact, Jesus, 15% of what the recorded words, 15% of Jesus' recorded words were on the subject of handling money and possessions. That is over one-tenth of what he spoke dealt with money and possessions. He spoke more about money and possessions than he spoke about hell and heaven. He had more to say about how we deal with our money and possessions than where we're going to spend eternity. He had more to say about that now than where you're going to spend eternity later. That's amazing to me. You mean, Jesus, you weren't as interested in heaven and hell? You weren't as interested in prayer? You weren't as interested in faith as you are finances and possessions? You're more interested in that? Amazing. Why is Jesus so interested in your possessions and your finances? Because in part, it determines where you go. And in part, it determines how you spend where you're going to get. It is based on your money and your possession. It is based on that. I'll prove it to you. We're going to look at <clears throat> Luke chapter 19 and we're going to look at this man Zacchaeus Luke chapter 19 Zacchaeus and we're going to start at verse uh, verse 1 Luke 19 uh, verse 1 it says in the city of Jericho there lived a very wealthy man named Zacchaeus who was the supervisor over all the tax collectors. So he was a prominent man within that city. 
He was head over all the tax collectors. And the writer is telling us he's a very wealthy man. And as Jesus made his way through the city, Zacchaeus was eager, eager to see Jesus, and he kept trying to get a look at him, but the crowd around Jesus was massive, and Zacchaeus was a very short man and couldn't see over the heads of the people. So he ran ahead of everyone, and he climbed up a blossoming fig tree so he could get a glimpse of Jesus as he passed by. Those trees in that area grew 40 feet plus. So we don't know how high up he went, but he went up high enough to be able to look down on the crowd and see Jesus. And when Jesus got to that place, he looked up into the tree and said, Zacchaeus, hurry on down, for I am appointed to stay at your house today. So he scurried down the tree and he came face to face with Jesus. And as Jesus left to go with Zacchaeus, many in the crowd complained, look at this. Of all the people to have dinner with, he's going to eat in the house of a crook. That's a whole nother message. Jesus loves to hang out with crooks. That's why he likes you. <coughs> So Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus joyously welcomed Jesus and was amazed over his gracious visit to his home. Zacchaeus stood in front of the Lord and said, listen to what he says. Zacchaeus stood in front of the Lord and said, half of all that I own, I will give to the poor. Jesus didn't ask him to give anything. Jesus didn't ask him to give anything. He was so taken by Jesus, realizing that he was an extremely wealthy man, he says to Jesus, I I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor. But he doesn't stop there. Then he goes on... And he says, and if I've cheated anyone, well, he did cheat people because his position allowed him to take advantage of people financially. And if I've cheated anyone, I promise to pay back four times as much as I stole. I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor, and if, anybody, if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to pay them back four times whatever I stole. Jesus said to him, this shows that today life has come to you and your household. Now, the NIV says, the NIV says, the kingdom of God has come to you today. Today it's come to you. Why did the kingdom of God come to Zacchaeus? Why, why did Jesus say, today you've entered the kingdom of God? Today, did he pray the sinner's prayer? Did he say to Jesus, I will follow you? Did he say to Jesus, I believe you're the Messiah? No, and I believe all that happened inside, but because it happened inside, something followed on the outside. Because I believe that you're God Almighty, because I believe that you're the Messiah, because I'm going to follow you, then this is what I'm going to do in response. I'm going to give my possessions to the poor because I have a lot of them. And if I've defrauded anybody, I'm going to make good on it because I'm going to turn my life around and I'm going to go from being a crook to being an honest man and as such, I'm going to pay everybody back that I stole from. And Jesus' response is, today, because of what you're doing, the kingdom of God has come to you. Today it's come to you. I wonder how many people don't respond at any level like that, and we wonder why there's the absence of the kingdom of God in our life. I mean, we can come to church and we can do, do, do Christianese things, 
But, but the true response to the presence of God and the true response to his authority and his lordship, the true response is I give up everything I have. <clears throat> That's the true response. Let's look at Matthew chapter 19. There's a different man. Matthew chapter 19 and this man is the rich young ruler. I got lost last week, now I'm getting lost again. I need a new Bible. Verse 16 through verse 22. Jesus meets a different man. And it says, then a teenager, actually, in the Aramaic, the wording here, young man, is the word for teenager. It says, then a teenager approached Jesus and bowed before him saying, wonderful teacher, is there a good work I have to do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus answered, why would you call me wonderful? God alone is wonderful. And why would you ask what good work you need to do? Keep the commandments and you'll enter into the life of God. Which one, he asked. Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother, and love those around you as you love yourself. So Jesus just rattles off some of the Old Testament commandments. And this is what the young man says. But I have always obeyed every one of them without fail. The young man replied, what else do I lack? Jesus said to him, if you really want to be perfect, go immediately and sell everything you own. <coughs> go immediately and sell everything that you own. Give all your money to the poor and your treasure will be transferred into heaven. Then come back and follow me for the rest of your life. Now, Zacchaeus was not a godly man. Zacchaeus was a thief, a known thief in his day. Zacchaeus encounters Jesus, and something deep transpires within him that says, I give up everything to follow Christ. And as a sign of that, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor, and anybody I've defrauded, I'm going to make good four times over. That was his response. Now you come to the rich young ruler and you have a godly man. You have a man that has obeyed all the law. He recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. He's coming to Jesus to ask, is there one thing I should do to inherit eternal life? Give me one thing. And Jesus gives him a number of things. He goes, I've done it all, man. I've done it all. And Jesus stops and looks at him and sees something deep inside of him. There's something deep inside of him that is, that is holding him back. There's something deep inside of him that is the roadblock to what God wants to do in his life. There's something deep inside of him. And if you know anything about Jesus, he has no problem telling you what it is. And he usually doesn't play around in mince words. He goes right to the heart of it. <clears throat> and Jesus says to him, Jesus says, you, 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 you lack one thing. There's one thing in you that's causing you to not inherit the kingdom of heaven. One thing. And he says, go immediately and sell everything you own. 
give all your money to the poor and your treasure will be transferred in heaven. What Jesus is saying is that by doing it, you will not lose it. It's going to be transferred to another bank account. You won't lose it. It's just being transferred for you to another bank account. Then come back and follow me. After you do it, come back and follow me. We don't have salvation messages like that, do we? We just tell people, follow Jesus and, 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 and figure it out as you go. But sometimes Jesus will say, if you're going to follow me, then I want you to stop doing that. It's a prerequisite to follow me. We don't, we don't like that, but I believe he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think he still says that sometimes. <clears throat> and when the young man heard these words, he walked away angry because he was extremely wealthy. When he heard them, he walked away angry because he was extremely wealthy. He wasn't willing to do it. He wasn't willing to do it. You see, it's not a matter of having money or possessions. That's not the issue. Jesus did not ask Zacchaeus to give up anything. Zacchaeus willingly did that. But Jesus did ask the rich young ruler to give up everything, to which the rich young ruler could not do it. See, it's not a matter of having something. It's a matter of what place does it have in your heart. It's when that something becomes the God mammon in your life when that something takes more importance than God Almighty in your life, when that something is something you think about more than you think about God, and you're more concerned about it than you're concerned about God, you have just taken God little g and put it on the pedestal in your life, and at that point, God asks you to take it down. There are no little g's before me, big G. And if you're going to serve me, the little G has to be dethroned and thrown out because big G is the only one that sits on the throne in your life. So does he ask everybody to go sell stuff? No, not necessarily, but I do believe that he asks us sometimes to do exactly that. And I'm not here to tell you how much you should have and how much you shouldn't have, what you should do with your possessions. That's between you and God. But let me tell you this. If God's not talking to you about it, then something's wrong with your relationship with him. Because he's, as, he's more concerned with how you handle possessions and money than almost anything else in your life because it's a prerequisite to where you're going and if you get there. So, when it was my birthday and I turned 32, <laughs> Deborah said, you know, before, before I get up to share, I always pray, God, forgive me for all the lies I'm going to tell. So I'm already forgiven. So you just don't even go there. Don't even say, don't even say, pastor's a liar. He already forgave me. So shame on you. So, so Deborah took me away. Deborah took me away for uh, a, a day or two. So Deborah took me away. So, so I, I think I've, I've shared this before, but I love pens. I, I'm a pen guy, and I, I kind of collect pens. I don't really collect, collect, but I kind of collect pens. And I, I've, I've loved pens all, all my adult life. I've got pens that go back to when I was just a young guy, given to me as gifts from companies and things like that. And uh, so, so I, I love pens. I just have this thing for pens. So, 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 we, so we went away. And where we went, there was a pen, a small boutique store 
there. And every time we go, I have to go to the pen store. And uh, so, so, so I, 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 I've been telling Deborah, I, there's this one pen I really want to get, but I, I just don't get it. <clears throat> so we go to the pen store, and, and, uh, and so I'm walking in, and I look at the one pen that I'm dreaming about, but I'd never buy it anyway, but I like to dream about it. And, and, and I look over, and in the case is this pen that, oh my God, I thought I had an out-of-body experience l looking at it. And, and the lady came up to me and she said, oh, you have good taste. <laughs> and I'm thinking, darn right I do. I know pens. And she said, would you like to handle it, sir? And I said, darn right I would. <laughs> so, so she took it out and, and I took it in my hand and I felt like John, the beloved, that I went up to the third heaven and saw things that were unutterable. I, I just could not describe the feeling and I felt like, I've never taken drugs but if I had it probably felt like that like I got I got high all of a sudden with with this pen so 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 I gave it back to her and I'm thinking I gotta have that pen that pen is is the dream of all pens I'll be happy for the rest of my life with the one pen so I tell her, uh, we're going to go get a sandwich. I might come back. I, I might get it, you know. Uh, and I don't. So Deborah's telling me, honey, you got to buy that pen. It's your birthday. You never get yourself anything on your birthday. And, and truth is, she hadn't bought me a birthday present in 10 years. <clears throat> so so she, she said, you got to buy it. I want you to have the pen. I want you to have the pen. And so we're sitting eating a sandwich, and I'm convincing myself I deserve that pen. And yeah, you didn't give me a birthday present last year. And by golly, we're going to get that pen today. And, and I'm, I'm just I'm convinced I'm going to go right back in there, and I'm going I'm to buy that pen. And God kind of speaks to me. And said, you know, it is a nice pen, and you do have excellent taste when it comes to pen. <laughs> but I just don't think you need it right now. Uh, and I don't think you should spend the money for that pen right now. Now, he didn't say don't. And I believe had I done it, I'm not going to go to hell. But he just whispered that he didn't think it was a good idea. So we got done eating the sandwich and we're walking back to, I, I start saying, well, let's go to the car and leave. She says, well, aren't you going to go back in the pen store and buy the pen? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to buy the pen. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to buy the pen. Let's just leave. Let's just go. And uh, I walked away and I said, I said, God, if you, if you ever want to bless me with that pen, um, then you're... you're <laughs> Because I still think it's I still think it's the best pen in the world, and if you ever if if you really love me, no, I didn't go, but then at some point you're going to have to bless me in such a way that I know that it's to buy that pen, right? So, long story short, we drive back, and I have to admit, I have to admit, I've gone on the internet, I've looked at it about eight million times. <clears throat> I have to admit, and each time I say, God. No, it's not, not the thing I should do. And I just left it with the Lord. I could have done it, but I choose to surrender my finances to the Lord. I choose. I choose to make him God over my checkbook. I choose to do that. And in some ways... In that little thing, it was an honor to say, God, I, I don't feel you're pleased with it, so I'm not doing it. So fast forward some weeks and months go by, and uh, a week or so ago, the Lord whispered to my heart. And he said, you know that money that you were going to spend on the pen? And I said, yeah, does it mean I can go get it now? <laughs> he, says, he says, no. Uh, he said, I want you to give it to City Church. 
And I thought, well, wait a minute. That, that was money that was going to be my birthday present and buy a pen. And, and uh, he said, yeah, but I want you to bless City Church. So I talked with Deborah. I said, Deborah, you know that money that we, I was going to spend the pen, I think I should give it to the church. He said, well, go give it to the church, for heaven's sakes. So, so I did. I did. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I could have gotten to heaven, right? And I'm sure the pen would go with me because... <clears throat> in my will I would tell Deborah bury me with that pen because when I have to sign in at the pearly gate I want that pen to, to sign my name and I'll, I'll keep it th through my tour of heaven so if I sign documents I'll tell the angel no thank you I got my own pen But because I obeyed God, when I get to heaven, I have treasure now in heaven that I'm really not taking with me. I transferred treasure. You, you see? I found a bank with a higher return on investment. So I transfer funds from this bank on earth where there's little return and I transfer it into a heavenly account where the Bible said there is great return. In fact, Pastor LT quoted it, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I transfer it into that account. And when I stand before the Lord, I'm going to reap the benefit of that account. That's how important possessions are. That's how important what you do with your money. See, what you do with it determines your eternity. Are you laying up treasures in heaven? Or are you just laying up treasures here? Because you're not taking it here. It ain't going with you. In fact, don't read the book of Ecclesiastics because you'll get suicidal. He said, what good is it all? He uses the phrase, what good is it all? It is, it is, it is pointless like spitting in the wind. There's no sense to spit in the wind. It's just going to get all over you. He said it is pointless to amass wealth because you're not taking it with you. You're going to leave it behind for somebody that will either appreciate it, not appreciate it, squander it, do whatever because it's not yours anymore. You go stand before God naked with nothing except what you laid up in heaven. That's the only thing that's going before you. But you don't take anything with you. And everything that you thought made life what it is, made life comfortable, made you secure, you're not taking it with you. In fact, I was reading the other day in Ecclesiastics, said... When you think about doing good to somebody, the wording is, why don't you go ahead and just do it? Because you don't know if you're going to wake up in the morning. Well, that's a concept. Well, should I give this person this, this, this? Should I bless this person with this? Solomon said, for heaven's sakes, do it. Because you might not wake up in the morning and it might be the last thing you did in this life and you would have laid up one more treasure in heaven that, that went up before you, so do it! Because you cannot go wrong when you do it. It is a sure investment where moth and rust and all of that thieves don't steal and it doesn't get corrupted. It is the most secure banking system known to man. John the Baptist in Luke Luke chapter 3, verse 7 through 14. Luke chapter 3. This is John the Baptist. But John... John kept preaching to the many crowds who came out to be baptized. 
You are nothing but the offspring of poisonous snakes full of deceptions. Well, that's really a good way to draw a crowd, huh? Bunch of snakes, poison. By the way, come back next week. <coughs> Have you been warned to repent before the coming wrath of God? Then turn away from your sins, turn to God, and prove it, prove it by a changed life. Wow. Don't think for a moment that it's enough to simply be favored descendants of Abraham. That's not enough to save you. I'm telling you, God could make more sons of Abraham out of the stones if he chose to. Even now, God's acts of judgment is poised to chop down your barren tree right down to its roots. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be leveled and thrown into the fire. And the crowd kept asking him, what then are we supposed to do? What do we do to be saved? John told them, give food to the hungry, clothe the poor, and bless the needy. Excuse me? I got to do that to be saved? I thought I just prayed a lot and went to church. No, he didn't say pray a lot, go to the synagogue, fast. He didn't say any of that. He said, he said, give food to the hungry, clothe the poor, and bless the needy. That's what you do. And even the despised tax collectors came to John to be baptized, and they asked, what are we to do to prove our hearts have changed? And he said, he said to them, be honest. Stop stealing people's money. Be honest. Don't demand more taxes than you are required to collect. And then those that were soldiers came to him and said, what do we do? And John answered them, be content with what you earn. Never extort money or terrify others by threats or violence or be guilty of accusing the innocent. You see, John's message what do we do to be saved? John's message had to do with what they had. It had to do with what they had. What are you doing with what you have now? Are you using what you have to build the kingdom of heaven? Are you using it for the kingdom of heaven? Or are you just using it for you? There are going to be a lot of people that stand before God that are going to be really surprised. In fact, in fact, Jesus said it this way. There are going to be people that stand before God and they're going to say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Lord, Lord, and when it's used three times, Lord, Lord, when it's used like that, the emphasis is on yelling in the original. Lord, Lord, I call you Lord. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You use my name and you claim lordship, but in reality, I am not lord of your life. I don't know you. So depart from me. There are going to be a lot of people that think. He went a step further. There are going to be people that prophesy in my name. People that do miracles in my name. People, he's going to say, but I'm going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You workers of iniquity. What does he mean by that? Because you are lawless unto yourself. The only law you abide by is your own law for living. You are lawless unto yourself. Acts chapter 2, verse 44. And I'm going to close with these two verses, uh, two ch chapter 2 and chapter 4. Acts chapter 2 and verse 44 says, this is how the early church responded. And all the believers were in fellowship as one body, and they shared one with one another, whatever they had. 
And out of generosity, they even sold their assets to distribute to their proceeds to those who were in need among them. And they met daily together. It's amazing that this early church, and they were not rich. They were not a Beverly Hills type church. And there were many poor among them. But it says that as a body, they took care of each other's needs as a body. Then you drop over to chapter, chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 32. It says, And all the believers were one in mind and heart. Selfishness was not a part of their community, for they shared everything they had with one another. Selfishness was not a part of their community. You know, churches sometimes can be a group of the most selfish people you can ever get in one room, especially if they're having lunch. I'll prove it to you. <laughs> one Sunday, I'm going to put one cheesecake out on the back table, <laughs> and I'm going to put a bunch of other secondary desserts. How many of you would agree that cheesecake is the bomb, right? But I, instead of having three, I'm going to put one out there, and I'm going to put a camera right over it. And then I'm going to watch people that go get lunch and they, they happen to notice there's cheesecake over there. They figure before I even start eating lunch, I'm going to go get cheesecake before they finish their lunch and beat me to the cheesecake. <laughs> you, you can keep your hand down. Don't tell them. <clears throat> Then there are those people that say, well, there's cheesecake but I want to make sure that I get enough cheesecake so I'm going to get four plates of cheesecake and they take half of the doggone cheesecake I'm just saying the early church there was no selfishness among them when there was one cheesecake out they said oh you go get it it's okay I'll eat that dried out cookie. It's all right. Don't worry, but don't worry about me. You have the cheesecake. I want you to have it. I want you to be blessed. <laughs> well, pastor, I don't know. I just, I just don't have much. The greatest example of giving in scripture is the widow's might. The story goes that Jesus goes to the temple and he's watching people give. That means he's sitting close enough to watch because he's interested in what they're giving. He's not watching from across the room. He's up front, personal, and close, watching what they're giving. And he's seeing everybody come in with large sums of money and give to the temple. But he notices that a widow comes with what was called, the coin was called the widow's might. It was basically about half the size of our penny. And he watched her take it out and drop it in. And he's close enough to see it and hear it hit the bottom of the pot. Bing! And she walks away. And he takes his disciples and he says, come here, come here. Do you see what that widow just did? She gave more than all of them because she gave of her very substance. They gave of their abundance. She gave of their... It's not the amount you give. There are people that have a lot, you should give a lot. There are people that have little, then you give little. But it is the condition of the heart in which you give. It's the condition of the heart in which you give. This widow had a heart to give. Those that were giving from their wealth didn't really have a heart to give. They were just doing it. 
well, pastor, I, 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 don't, I don't have a lot. Um, you don't understand. Let me, let me give you some math, some just simple math. If you start working at the age 25 and you retire out at 65 and you make 25,000 a year salary, you make 25,000 a year, that's not counting bonuses, social security, retirement, that's not, that's not counting any of that. Just, just count the 25,000 a year. By the time you retired, you would have made over $1 million. So you might not think you have a lot, but you are stewarding over a lifetime. You are the steward of over $1 million. Our nation today is the most, out of the history of this world, our nation today is in the most effluential place out of any other nation in history. The poverty level in our nation today, our poverty level is higher than the medium income level of most all other nations. Our poverty level is higher than the medium income of all other nations. So you might be here and say, well, you don't understand. I don't have much. I, I, I'm barely making it. And, and I'm not here to argue that. But I'm, I'm here to say that over your lifetime, you are the steward of $1 million. And some here, you are a steward of a lot more than that. As the steward over $1 million, how do you steward that? How do you steward that? See, that's the question you have to ask yourself. Because when you stand before the Lord, and he, he said, I gave you five talents, or I gave you one talent, what did you do with the talent I gave you? You can't say, well, you don't understand, Lord. I, 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 I didn't have anything to give. Yeah, you, you did. I gave you one talent. What did you do with the talent I gave you? That's what determines, it's not the amount we give, it's what we do with what we have that determines our forever future. That's why that's so important, that's why Jesus spoke about it more than anything else. That's why scripture speaks about it two times more than heaven and hell, or prayer and faith. That's why, because it's that important. It is your future. You can't ignore it. I cannot ignore it. What I do determines my future. There is a God of this world. There is a God called Mammon. And he dictates. And that's why People kill, rob, steal for wealth, cheat, destroy, go to prison just to get up on the other guy. And they can all go downstream just fine. But we as the people of God, we are called, when it comes to our finances and possessions, we are called to live upstream. We don't go with the tide. We go against the tide. The whole world could say, get, get, and get more, and don't give any of it. But I choose to obey God's word that says, the more you get, the more you should give. It's plain and simple. And here's the thing, I'm going to leave you with this. You cannot, you cannot live contrary to kingdom principle and expect kingdom blessing. I'm going to say it again. You cannot live a lifestyle that is contrary to kingdom principle and expect kingdom blessing. The only way that you can expect kingdom blessing is to live according to kingdom principle. And when you live according to kingdom principle, then you automatically have the rights 
to kingdom blessing. It is my, it is my God-given right. It is my right to be blessed financially. It is my right for God to take care of my needs. It is my God-given right because I live according to his principles. I give according to his principles. And he said it, he promised it, he'll do it, that makes it my right. That's not to be egotistical, but I make demands on heaven. I have a right to make a demand on heaven. I'm doing according to the kingdom of heaven. I live within the confines of the kingdom. I give according to the kingdom of heaven. You are Lord over my money, my finances, and my possessions. I'll give you anything you want. I have a right to be blessed by God. I expect it. I expect to be blessed by God. <clears throat> And who knows, I might even get a pen. <laughs>